Well, welcome to the Aging Boomers. I'm your host, Frank Sampson. Of course, on our show, we discuss so many of the issues facing boomers, their families, their parents, and what we know, of course, is an aging population. I just want to thank everybody for uh, for joining us, for all the support. So many of you have uh, registered on iTunes, iHeartRadio. Many of you have downloaded our free app uh, that you can uh, uh, get on your iPhone, Android phone, iPad, etc. Just go to the App Store and type in the Aging Boomers, and then you can keep up to date on all of our uh, great interviews, uh, which we're going to have another one today. Just want to remind you that today's show is sponsored by Senior Care Authority, a professional senior placement and elder care consulting organization that has a national network of advisors to help in determining the right path for senior living and receiving proper care. So whether you need just an advocate or assistance within home care, assisted living, residential or memory care, get the necessary advice from a senior care advisor in your area by calling Senior Care Authority at 888-809-1231 or you could go directly to the website at www.seniorcareauthority.com. I uh, also want to thank everybody for all your support on my uh, new book, recent book, called The Aging Boomers. Uh, and uh, actually, my guest today, Dr. J. Olshansky, was a great inspiration for me in writing that book. So, uh, Jay, thank you for that, and thank you for joining us on The Aging Boomers. No, I'm happy to be on, and congratulations on your book. Uh, extremely well done. Yeah, yours too. Uh, just a quick intro. Uh, uh, J. Uh, Dr. Olshansky received his Ph.D. in sociology at the University of Chicago in 1984. He is currently a professor in, in the School of Public Health at the University of Illinois at Chicago, research, uh, research associate at the Center of Aging at the University of Chicago, and at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and Chief Scientist at Lapidus Solutions. The focus of his research to date has been on the estimates of the upper limits to human longevity and the health and public policy implications associated with individual and population aging. Dr. Olshansky is the author of a few books, he is the first author of The Quest for Immortality, Science at the Frontiers of Aging, as well as A Measured Breath of Life, and co-editor of Aging, The Longevity Dividend, which we'll talk a little bit about. Also, he recently achieved a great honor of being on Next Avenue's 2016 Influence, Influencers in Aging. So congratulations on that. That's a great honor, Jay. Thank you very much. Yeah. So let's uh, get right into it. All right. Uh, bottom line, is there a way for us to determine how long we can live? Uh well, you know, I wish that there was some sort of magical uh, crystal ball that we could look into. Actually, I'm not so sure I wish that. I'm not sure everybody would want to know <laughs> the answer to the one. question. You know, if somebody could tell you when you would die, your exact date of death, I'm not so sure too many people would want to know that. Uh, but can we generate some sort of reliable estimate to give you a sense of how to plan for the future uh, and just to give you a, a, a general answer, the answer would be yes. It is possible wow. to, to use data uh, that's available on populations to look at your particular attributes. Let's just say you're a female aged 70. You've got a family history of exceptional longevity. Um, it does provide some useful clues into what your prospects are for survival and what your prospects are for healthy life and in the end that's really important is to know what your anticipated remaining healthy years of life are likely to be for people with your characteristics and then how many additional years of life you can expect to have and the difference between the two is what you need to is what needs to be planned for by many people listening to your program mm -hmm. you know how what what when do things go wrong uh, how long does it last what are the consequences associated with it we actually have the capacity uh, to do that to some extent, but it, it it will not be a precise 
personal estimate. Nobody can actually do that. I don't think anyone will be able to do that. But we can give you a good, pretty good sense of what you need to plan for, what's likely to happen. So somebody listening to this show, they want to know, how do I do that? Well, um, all right. So originally, my colleagues and I had actually created a site, a website, that allows you to get an estimate uh, like this. It was, it's called facemyage.com. Now, we actually put that on a temporary hold uh, while we're updating it. So uh, maybe uh, perhaps by the time this makes it out, uh, the website will be up, and you'll be able to key in your information. You go to a website, you answer some questions, and it'll give you an estimate of expected number of years of life remaining, the probability that you'll make it, to subsequent ages like 65 or 85 or 90, um, and then how many years of healthy life you could expect to have. Beyond that, there are some calculators that are out there on the Internet, but they're not really all that good. They prov tend to provide overestimates of longevity, uh, so I wouldn't, wouldn't rely on those. So for the moment, you know, wait for our site to come back. Okay, great. Great. So, you know, uh, I didn't mention you've been on the show before, which uh, you, you're always providing us some uh, most recent developments going on. Can you tell us some uh, recent developments in your efforts and to slow aging as a way to improve public health? I mean, can you give us some, some recent ones? Yes. Um so one of the more interesting ones, there's been, there are a couple of them, but one of the more interesting ones that's come up lately is an effort to slow aging by introducing certain compounds into the body that have been documented to slow biological aging. And one of the more interesting ones might be uh, compounds or substances that, that, uh, that your listeners may already be taking. One is called metformin. Uh, metformin is a uh, a compound that's being used to treat diabetes, especially type 2 diabetes, uh, which is certainly common among um, folks beyond a certain age. And we're now noticing that there seem to be side effects associated with metformin. But instead of the negative side effects, which you often hear about on um, TV programs, this one seems to have positive side effects, like we see with aspirin, for example. It seems to lower the risk of a wide variety of diseases and disorders. Uh, so we're beginning clinical trials on this, hopefully sometime next year, that will allow us to assess just how to do this, how safe it might be, what the implications are, how much longer and healthier it might make you live. So there's interest in compounds like this. And, that, and then I will tell you about another one that should be of, of, of real interest to folks. It's a phenomenon called parabiosis. Parabiosis has actually been studied for a long time. It's basically... Uh, when researchers connect up the cardiovascular system of young and old animals, they discover that the younger animals experience a form of accelerated aging, but interestingly, the older animals experience a form of decelerated aging. Now, while I'm not, this isn't, shouldn't sound like it's a, you know a, a vampire story or anything like that, um, which I've, I've seen in the literature um, on occasion, nor should you expect to get hooked up to your grandchildren <laughs> anytime soon, in terms of your, of your cardiovascular system, what it does mean is that there may, when, you're, when your child is born, when your grandchild is, is born, uh, if the, your children or grandchildren are having their uh, stem cells frozen at the time of birth, it's possible that those stem cells might be used to create certain other types of cells that have the potential to slow aging in their parents and grandparents. Mm -hmm. uh, and that technology, that science is advancing fairly rapidly. It's very exciting. Uh, and it's one of many, many research projects that are going on uh, very, very right cool. now or about to start in the future. Very cool. I want to go back to the metformin, if I can. So I don't want people to think that, I mean, if you are taking metformin and you do have diabetes, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be slowing your own aging process. I mean, I know the research has to be done, but would well, that also might, be applicable it, to people with diabetes that are taking yes, it? Yes. Oh, wow. So, so it might actually mean that. It might mean exactly that. Wow. Uh, it may very well be the case that if your listeners are taking metformin for diabetes right now, 
it's possible that they may already be experiencing a form of decelerated aging. Mm. When I say that, by the way, you might ask, what does that mean exactly? Well, it, it means that your risk of, of death from heart disease, from cancer, from stroke, from Alzheimer's, uh, and from diabetes all seem to be reduced simultaneously. So, yes, it is entirely possible that but listeners we, we, on metformin now may yeah. already be experiencing but we've heard, age. we've heard actually there's been studies that I've read just the opposite with diabetics increasing their chances of getting Alzheimer's. Well, having diabetes in and of itself leads to an elevated risk of a broad range of diseases and disorders, Alzheimer's perhaps uh, one among many. Mm -hmm. So there's no question, and especially if it's left untreated, uh, there's no question that having diabetes is harmful. But, and this is critical, the treatment for diabetes works. There's plenty of treatments for diabetes, including, by the way, diet and exercise, which have a very powerful effect. Uh, but beyond that, some of the compounds that are being taken allow us to treat these conditions with a high degree of efficiency. And now we seem to be seeing some secondary uh, effects or side effects associated with these treatments. And that is a positive sign for other diseases and, and disorders. So, you know, you know, you're right. Certainly left untreated, it's a bad, bad situation. But treated, it might actually be better than we think. Wow. So yeah, how, uh, <laughs> this could be years or, I mean, before it's determined? Well, it, it will probably be years before any sort of uh, basic therapeutic recommendation is made to use metformin to treat other conditions and, and disorders. It'll be up to phys personal, uh, you know, individuals and their personal physician to make a determination on whether somebody who is not on metformin should go on metformin. Certainly, I would wait until the clinical trials are in to give us a sense of what the dose should be, who should be on it, and so forth. But, but uh, I'm guessing a lot of your listeners are going to benefit from this technology. It'll be within our lifetime. We'll know the answer. Wow. wow. So there's a couple different, um, I don't know if they're theories or things that I've read. So I want to bring up a couple, one at a time here, and I'd like you to comment on it. So is it true that something in the blood of younger people could help older people to age more slowly? Well, so this was this phenomenon of parabiosis that I was talking about earlier. And yes, uh, it, you know, clearly we, we have seen this in the scientific literature that, that uh, some particular substance contained within the blood, and we don't know what it is yet, seems to have an effect of uh, decelerating the aging process in older animals. Researchers are trying to discover what that important factor is that's contained within the blood, and then they're going to try and replicate that with the use of stem cell therapy. Uh, and I think that is going to be uh, forthcoming. But like anything, any new intervention like this, it's going to require clinical testing to make sure it's safe, to make sure it's efficacious. Um, I, I will provide a warning to your listeners, though, because on occasion, when stories like this come out, what you'll see is in, in certain parts of the United States, but also in parts of Europe, you get these rather bizarre stories of people trying to get blood transfusions from younger people uh, to try to mimic the effect of parabiosis. And I, that's just a bad idea. It's, uh, there's no evidence that uh, doing this now in people will work the way, we, the way we're seeing it in these other animals. You have to wor worry about... Uh, compatibility of blood uh, between uh, individuals and so it's premature to be considering parabiosis as some sort of available treatment today but it may come uh, down the line in the future it probably won't come down uh, in terms of, of being connected to a younger person in terms of your cardiovascular system it's more likely that you may get an infusion of your own blood or your own child's blood or grandchild's blood or blood factor, whatever that is, um, throughout your life to slow down the aging process. But yes, actually there is evidence to suggest that something like this is plausible. Hmm. Well, Not ready for prime time yet. Yeah, okay, all right. <laughs> um, also there's some, a lot of things written about the fact of looking 
younger. And I know that you, in the program that you, uh, software program that you, you brought up earlier that you have on hold right now, but maybe it's live by the time people listen to this, um, you know, the fact that uh, maybe if you look younger, you'll live longer. The fact that uh, uh, that maybe children of longer lived people tend to look young for the, her age. T- give us some more information on all the, all these, you know, yeah. I, I'm not sure if they're in, innuendos or facts. No, it's actually true. Um, we've actually studied centenarians, people who live past 100, and their children. Uh, We have photographs of them. We even have photographs of the centenarians when they were younger, and we see a consistent pattern throughout the scientific literature when studying these long-lived people. And that is, these individuals, when they were younger, always looked younger for their age throughout their lifespan. And the same thing holds for their children. The children of long-lived people also tend to look younger for their age. So what exactly does looking younger for your age mean? Let's say, hypothetically, you are 70 years old and you look like you're 50, or you're 60 years old and you look like you're 40, sort of like you, Frank. Yeah, I was going to say like you, but you beat me to it. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So, you know, what we think is happening is that you're actually experiencing, you have been experiencing throughout your life a form of decelerated aging. In other words, chronologically, while you might be 60 or 70, biologically, you might be 40 or 50. And that that biological uh, fact that you are younger than your chronological age translates into a lower risk of death, greater longevity, uh, lower risk of frailty and disability, and delayed onset of many of the major conditions that we don't like that's associated with, with growing older. So absolutely, there is very powerful uh, scientific evidence that suggests that looking younger for your age is associated with greater longevity, it's associated with being younger biologically, and we can now measure that. And that's actually what that website was designed to do. So we're, we're going to work hard to try and get it back up and operational. And I would t- will tell you, by the way, I'll give your listeners a clue into something that we're adding to the website. We're adding something called age progression. So um, you, when you upload a photograph, let's say you're 60 years old, you'll be able to ask the question, what will I look like when I'm 70? Or what will I look like when I'm 80? Or what will I look like when I'm 80 if I smoke? Or if I choose to not smoke? Or or adopt a healthy lifestyle? And we're deciding now whether or not we want to include uh, an age decompression component where you can ask the question, all right, what did I look like 20 years ago? (laughs) And and we actually have the software uh, to, to do that. We actually have the capacity take a photograph and show you what you look like when you were younger and show you what you'll look like when you're older. It's really uh, fun technology. I think back when, uh, and, uh, you remember this, when the Beatles were, uh, you know, huge, they still are, but in our day, and, and a, a magazine came out showing how they would look when they get older. I re- and that's what kind of sticks in my mind. And that that's kind of what you're talking about, right? Yes. Uh, actually, I don't The fun of technology. There we go. Hello. Hey, uh, the fun of technology. So we got Dr. Jail Shansky back with us now. So you were we were talking about the Beatles and the aging and all of that. So I'll let you continue. Yeah, I was just saying that uh, that my my dad, when uh, he, he was in his early nineties, would refer to me as a, uh, a youngster in my when I was in my late fifties, and he was right. Uh, it's all relative, um, but our concepts of age and aging are changing pretty dramatically. And you know, if you take a look at pictures of your grandparents when they were your age in their sixties, right? Um, they looked really old. I mean, yeah. really old. 
Yeah. And uh, and now you compare us to them, and by comparison, we you know we seem to be about 20 years younger. I don't know how much longer that can continue, um, but uh, clearly there's plenty that we can do uh, to uh, you know in terms of adopting a healthy lifestyle to in- encourage our bodies to remain youthful for a longer time period. Eventually, time and age catches up with us, but we're learning about the the uh, dynamics of the of these aging bodies and what we could do to keep them youthful for a longer time period. Yeah, I, w- I want to go back to what you said about you know the, the there's evidence to show that those that are looking younger, uh, have, you know, could live longer. But doesn't that kind of go back? I mean, you could look young and not be exercising, not eating right. So is there a correlation there at all? Or Well, look, um, if you ask centenarians, people who live past 100, what their secret to living long is, they will often tell you that they adopted atrocious lifestyles. Some of them smoked. The longest lived person in the world smoked for 100 years. Now, that's not a license to smoke. Most of us will die earlier if we do, but it tells you that that what we often think of as harmful isn't harmful uh, for everyone. Uh, right. Even diet, as important as it is, isn't harmful for everyone uh, th- in exactly the same way. So, yeah, I mean, I would be cautious about how you read and interpret the literature, especially on longevity. There's lots of claims about what you can and cannot do to achieve uh uh, a long and healthy life and you know the the truth of the matter is, is that the va- the most important factor that influences your prospects for a long and healthy life are genetics what happened to your parents what happened to your grandparents if they had a healthy lifestyle how long did they live what particular risk factors did they face because chances are you inherited those same risk factors what, what, and the what? longer you live yeah. As an individual, believe it or not, this is going to sound kind of odd. The longer you live, the less important your lifestyle is to, to how, how many additional years of life you may have left. It, it basically tells you that genetics plays an, an extremely important role in determining uh, health and duration of life. Now, you, the control that you have is to shorten your life. You know, we adopt unhealthy lifestyles all the, all the time and so i think your underlying point is we can control what we can control which is diet and exercise and once you've done that you've done about as much as you can to influence your health quality and duration of life and after that it's up to chance and genetics i mean i would love to know if diet uh not not eating that great would not have an effect on me because I'd be eating, you know, deep dish pizza and Chicago hot style hot dogs all the time. You know, be great to know. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it does have an influence. There's no question yeah. that you can shorten your life. It's one of the easiest things to do is to shorten your life. Right. Uh, we do it all the time. You want to adopt an unhealthy lifestyle, pick up smoking. For smoking, for most people, smoking is going to be harmful. It won't be harmful for everyone. So, you know, chances are you and I fall into a window of, uh, of a population subgroup where if we eat too much, we get too fat. Um, that body fat's associated with an elevated risk of a wide variety of diseases and disorders, and we don't want to do that. So diet and exercise, you know, that's what we can control now. We know that has a powerful influence on health and quality of life, but, but keep in mind that it doesn't apply equally to everyone. You're going to have plenty of people who live healthy lifestyles that drop dead in their 40s and 50s uh, due to uh, you know, genetic or chance events that occur within their bodies. Mm-hmm. And you can have people with unhealthy lifestyles, what, what we call unhealthy lifestyles, that live past 100. Um, yeah. It's just another way of saying, by the way, that that um, what's really important is how how you live your life today. Yeah, and, and that's really the way to look at it. Yeah, uh, I mean, it is a <clears throat> kind of a amazing to me, and I, I know you you know you know about this is how various parts of the world, certain parts of the world, and how people live and eat that there's you know 
people are living longer in in certain areas, certain areas of Italy, certain you know areas around the around the world, and just the opposite in other areas. So there's got to be something to that, I would think. Well, there are, yeah, there are longevity hotspots. Some people call them blue zones, but there are right. hotspots where people live exceptionally long lives. I was just reading a story this morning. I was actually reviewing a journal article today uh, about a place in uh, Costa Rica, Nicoya, uh, where there seems to be a group of exceptionally long-lived men. Uh, but, you know, these hotspots exist all over the world. There's a, uh, Okinawa, uh, Japan, Seventh-day Adventists in uh, Western California, near where you're at. Um, you know, there's a, a hotspot in Canada. There's a hotspot in Italy. These places exist where people live exceptionally long lives, and we're trying to discover what it is about these subgroups of the population that allow them to live so long. There is a, a common misconception out there that if we can adopt the lifestyle of an Okinawan or, a, or somebody from uh, Nicoya or some other part of the world where people live long lives, that we'll live as long as they do. No, it actually doesn't work that way. It probably wouldn't be a bad idea to adopt a Mediterranean uh, diet in, uh, in general, uh, given the you know, level of obesity that exists in the United States today. But uh, for the most part, uh, you know, the only way you're going to live as long as a, uh, somebody from uh, Okinawa, Japan, is to be from Okinawa uh, in uh, Japan. And we are not Japanese, so we are not going to be living as long as them, even if we adopt their, hmm. their lifestyle. There's probably a very powerful genetic factor that's influencing the risk of death uh, in these subgroups of the population. But that's what we're trying to, to discover. We're trying to, to take DNA from these subgroups of the population to figure out what uh, what genes might be contributing to the uh, lower disease risk and exceptional longevity that's observed in these populations. And by the way, let me point out that these people from uh, Okinawa or the Seventh-day Adventists, those folks are likely to be aging more slowly. You know, it's just like I said earlier, the, while they chronologically might be 70 or 80, biologically they might be 50 or 60. Uh, and that's why they're living that long. They're, they're not actually that age. You know, I, um, let's just say hypothetically, I don't remember your age, but you've got to be in your 60s somewhere. Right, but right. let's say hypothetically, biologically, you're in your 50s. The mm -hmm. risk of death in people doubles about every seven to eight years. So biologically, let's say if you're in your late 50s and chronologically you're in your mid-60s, it means your actual risk of death is about half that of the average 65-year-old, uh, just by way of example. Right. So it's uh, pretty pretty dramatic. Yeah. So I, I, unfortunately, we don't have much time. I want to just, if you could take a, a couple minutes or uh, tell us kind of for our, I know uh, we're both grandparents. We're very fortunate, right? And uh, so for our kids, our grandchildren, are they going to see a cure to some of these major diseases that are killing so many people, cancer, Alzheimer's, et cetera? What, what, what's going to happen? Um, well, our grandchildren may see cures for some major diseases. I, I don't, you know, Alzheimer's, cancer, these are conditions that are associated with exceptional longevity. Finding a cure, I don't think it's in the cards for most major conditions. We, I think we're going to get really good at them. Now, might there be a breakthrough that allows us to find a cure for certain types of of cancers or, or certain types of diseases. I don't know for sure. Alzheimer's, it's going to be tough. Is it possible? Yes. Should we be pursuing cures? Yes. Are we likely to see them in our lifetime, yours and mine? No, I don't think so. Our children, perhaps our grandchildren, I would be much more optimistic that they might see some sort of major breakthrough. But I would be cautious about breakthroughs. Breakthroughs, any breakthrough in the field has to influence the aging of the entire body, mind and body, simultaneously. Because if all we do is live longer by attacking one disease at a time, like heart disease, cancer, stroke, we may not like the result. We may expose the saved population to an elevated risk of other diseases and disorders that we don't like. And so we have to be careful what we wish for. Life extension without health extension would be a disaster. And that's really what we're trying to pursue now in the world of aging sciences, health extension only. Dr. 
S. J. Olshansky, thank you so much for, for joining us on the Aging Boomers. A wealth of information as always. Check out uh, what Jay's uh, up to all the time. You could go to his website at S. J. Olshansky, O L S H A N S K Y dot com. So uh, thank you again for, for joining us. I, I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. For- All right. Uh, Everybody, uh, just uh, be safe out there. Thank you for joining us on the Aging Boomers, and we'll talk to you all soon.